Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman, currently retired on my third try and getting better at it every time. So I'm glad to be here at Think Tech Hawaii at the Pioneer Plaza and trying to bring some good energy news to you. Last week when we had Ryan Wubbins on the show, we talked a little bit about, you know, having the courage to be an early adopter and, and having the, the um, fortitude to go out and just be the change, to just go out and do it instead of waiting for the government to tell you or waiting for um, somebody to, uh, to make it a, an incentive, like put it on the sale or give you any kind of incentive. Just go out and get yourself off the grid, make yourself sustainable. And we talked about it, but it's a lot harder to do when you don't have the experience to do energy things. So this week's guest um, is Russ Kohler, and he's the president of the Hawaii chapter of the Association of Energy Engineers. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about the folks that are out there in the world, in the community, uh, that can help you make good decisions on energy choices, uh, particularly if you're on a larger scale. But, uh, you know, even if you have a, a smaller project, they'll, they'll help narrow down the search for a, a good engineer and some good folks that can help you out. So, also, thanks for being on the show today. I appreciate it's my it. pleasure, Stan. So, give us a little bit of background on yourself, and then, then we'll start talking about your organization. Well, I'm uh, originally from New Jersey. I uh, I went to a Merchant Marine Academy. Okay. This is where I started learning all about uh, energy, and, and really the study was about cogeneration. Mm -hmm. I have always felt that a ship was the best form of cogeneration that we know of. Um, I graduated with an engineering degree, immediately came out to California to work with my dad, who had started an energy management company, California American Energy Savings. So that's when I really started cutting my teeth on energy management. That was back, way back in 1976. Wow. So I've been involved with energy for quite some time. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the Association of Energy Engineers and how it kind of overlaps my experience. AEE was actually founded in 1977. Oh, so you predate AEE. I predated AEE as an as a, as a incorporated uh, association. I actually joined with my brother in 1980. Mm. So I've been a member for quite a few years. Um, I got my certification uh, or my certified energy manager certification in about mid early 90s. Mm -hmm. I became a life member in uh, around 1999. You know, when you, you started, you talked about the, going to the Merchant Marine Academy and, and you were, you know, I, I had a show a couple months ago where we talked about maritime fuel cells and ah. some of the technology out there. And there's a company out there now, um, shoot, I can't remember the name of it, and they specialize in cogeneration. And they have a, um, a technology that uses low-grade waste heat to generate power. And they claim that on a ship, they can produce 20% of the ships, this is a cruise ship, so they've got mm -hmm. a lot of power requirements. 20% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of the cruise ship's energy off the waste heat from the engine. That's probably true, Stan, uh, and that's probably an organic Rankin cycle system. Yeah. Um, I've been involved with a couple of organic Rankin cycles. Um, you mentioned fuel cells. I've worked a lot with fuel cell energy out of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they actually produce a a cogeneration style of fuel cell using natural gas as the fuel, mm -hmm. breaking up the, the methane from the, from the O2 and the water and, and uh, just using the hydrogen, and it becomes a cogeneration system. Um, I almost put 11 megawatt system into our pharmaceutical company in California so that we could eliminate boiler, boiler load, at least uh, two 700 horsepower boilers producing steam with the, with the fuel cell, and uh, certainly being almost near, near zero emission, um, no combustion. So, uh, orc cycle uh, is, is definitely a, a good way to use waste heat. Uh, fuel cell energy built a 15 megawatt plant for, I can't remember the name of the utility, in Connecticut that did not have any use for the waste heat, so they put the, or the organic rake and cycle on the, on the far end, mm -hmm. took all the waste heat from the fuel cell, produced another megawatt of, of electricity that went directly into the grid. That's great. 
Because I, I know that when we talk about building systems, uh, efficient systems, energy efficient systems, sustainable systems, one of the first things you do is go for efficiency. Absolutely. Like before you throw a bunch of PV on a house, you might as well make the house efficient and then build the PV to, to meet the requirements. Exactly. You make it more efficient, you have to put less PV into the house. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about your organization and, and you know, some of the criteria that uh, uh, the qualifications you have to have to be a member of the organization. What is that like? So you, you, one qualification is obviously schooling, mm -hmm. an right? engineering degree of, of some sort, whether it be civil, electrical, mechanical, uh, what have you. Uh, otherwise, it, you can have enough experience within your lifetime, within the field, Mm. And that will qualify you to be able to sit for a certification. Uh, the, the prime certification from Association of Energy Engineers is the Certified Energy Manager, CEM. Um, there are 23 different certifications. And uh, what really what AEE is about is teaching. They, they bring this teaching not just to the state or nationally, but it's an international organization. We're in a hundred different countries. And my favorite thing to do annually is to go to their world conference. This year happens to be in Washington, DC. Um, gives me two benefits. My son is actually at uh, Georgetown Grad School. Oh, neat. So I get to spend some time with him, but also spend the time with some great people and a, and a lot of people that are focused on the same the same uh, areas that, that I am and uh, that certainly you are. Mm -hmm. um, last year, 19, uh, or 2018, I was, I was honored by being inducted into the Association of Energy Engineers uh, Energy Manager Hall of Fame. Oh, wow, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, out of the you know, 18,000 plus members of the association, there's only 64 that have been inducted to a year. In fact, I, induct, I, I nominated a, a person from Hawaii last year, or this year, uh, George Benda, you might know George. Um, he's been in the energy field for many, many, many years, founded the Chelsea Group here in Hawaii, uh, has since retired. Um, he didn't make the nomination this year, but I, I, the induction, but I'm gonna nominate him again next year. Keep plugging away. Absolutely, plug away. Yeah. He was our vice president of uh, Molokai Lanai but in his previous years. So you, so you get a background either uh, a formal education in engineering or you said or by experience because you give, could you give us an example of the kind of experience that would, would allow you to get us get certified? Sure, in fact I'm, uh, I, I'm trying to help a person at, at the, the base, the, the military base that I work at uh, he's got a lot of HVAC experience. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of um, energy management system control experience. Those are two of the primary areas of, uh, of experience you need for a certified energy manager, or yeah, many of these certified energy auditing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so when I say experience, I'm talking probably 10, 15, uh, 15 to 20 years experience. Okay. And how many people belong to the Hawaii chapter? About 130. And on all islands? On all islands okay. that belong to the chapter at this point. And, and how would people go about you know, contacting these folks, or why would they contact them? Is there, it would, would people be seeking out members of the AEE to uh, get expertise, or are they, contra are they consultants? Or you know. They are. They're, they're from all walks of life out here, from, from HECO, from NAVFAC, uh, you know, Johnson Controls, Zamoresco, any one of the major companies out here, even the Chelsea Group that I mentioned, which has now become part of Amoresco, mm -hmm. uh, they all have folks that have a, a okay. CEM certification. Uh, we offer classes. In fact, um, I have two classes right now that we're working on. One is in December, December 8th, which is open to the public uh, for certification energy ma of energy management. Um, it's going to take place here in Honolulu at, at a HECO site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just arranged another one for NAFAC that's going to take place October 21st. So it's a one-day class? It's a four-day class. Okay. 
and the half a day, fifth day is the exam. Okay. So you have to pass an exam and, you know, I would say study hard. Lots of math. During the week. There's enough math to give people a, you know, <laughs> scare. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. But um, Vicki, who you met right. not too long ago, she's actually a CEM and a CEA. Okay. Um, so she's... Uh, She's, uh, she's quite a good secretary for, for me. Okay, so she's secretary toes. of the Hawaii chapter? She's secretary of the Hawaii chapter, that's okay. correct. She's from the Big Island. She's from the Big Island. Yeah, I plan to be working with her. Um, she wanted me to introduce her to the Blue Planet research folks. I connected her up with Paul Pontio over there, and um, I'm hoping that works out well because I think uh, she, she struck me as being a really sharp individual. And, uh, and Paul's a really bright, uh, uh, he's actually an architect. But, um, she, she, is, stuff. she is a very sharp individual. Before she got her CEM, she actually is a PhD in, in a different subject. But uh, she knows her stuff. She mentioned to me an event at Blue Planet at the end of the month, mm -hmm. uh, August 30th. Um, I don't know exactly what's going on, but there's going to be an exhibit there showing all the different wares, and okay. including the hydrogen barbecue. Yep. Which... Um, so she's asked me if I wanted to come out, and I, I would, I would take her up on it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and take her up yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you ever get invited to go out to see Blue Planet Research's uh, laboratory and and what they do, I would, I would take that opportunity right away. I want to. Yeah, I want to. So the Hawaii chapter covers uh, a lot of folks that are employed in the industry to deal with en uh, energy. And um, so it's really more like a, a certification that kind of piggybacks on uh, or, or adds to your, your actual job. Absolutely. So, okay. Some of the qualifications for a lot of the, uh, the positions these days at, at the, any one of the military bases, they call resource efficiency managers. Uh, I'm a senior energy engineer. All of those positions require to have a CEM. Okay. And what I'm noticing, uh, even throughout NAFAC, even the energy manager I mentioned earlier at, at my base, these guys come into these positions and are required that within two years they get their CEM okay. certification. So I, I've seen it now nationwide where it's actually a qualification on the, on the position. You either have it or you guarantee to get it within a certain amount of time. Okay. So right now, Hawaii has a um, energy portfolio standard that requires us to be 100% renewable on the grid by 2045. And that, that, to me, that's a really tall order. I, I mean, I, I don't know that most people think much about what that really means in practical terms, in terms of the grid architecture and things like that. What are your thoughts on trying to meet that 2045 goal and where we're at now at getting there? I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, Stan. I, in fact, I spent a lot of time thinking about that before I even came to Hawaii. I, I didn't mention, but I've only been in Hawaii full-time since uh, summer of 2017. Mm -hmm. My wife was born and raised here. She's a local. She went to Kamehameha High School. We got married out here in 1985. But I only transitioned out here uh, in the last couple of years. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about Hawaii and that 2045 goal, which it, it, it's a very tough goal for Hawaii to achieve. Um, well, what makes it so tough? I mean, I, I think I understand why, but a lot of people out there, um, I don't think appreciate the complexity. Could you give us an idea of some sure. of the complexity? Well, one of the complexities is that Hawaii Electric that supplies all of our electricity is still running on fuel oil. Mm -hmm. And for them to transition to what they claim to be biofuel, uh, in my mind, is still a combustion fuel. Yeah. Uh, it's still a fuel it's that's going to carbon based. It's still carbon based. It's still going to put out an emission. And for me, that doesn't make that qualification. So that right there tells me there's no way you're going to meet that 2045 goal. I mean, I have looked at many different things, and just to talk story, the AES coal plant is going to go away. Mm -hmm. you 
you know, what's, the, what's the thinking on how are we going to replace that 180 megawatts of load? Yeah. I know what I've been thinking of, about. Of, of firm you know, power. Yeah. With firm power. And I, I think we should be replacing it with fuel cells. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. And, you know, how would we do that? How would we generate or produce all that hydrogen to do that? Well, to me, it's a, it's a two-way thing. We've got a pipeline going right through there that's got natural gas from Hawaii gas. You could start out with, with natural gas fuel cells for a lot of that sure. load, and you could back that up with hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, right now, fuel cell energy may, has a, uh, a model fuel cell that will produce hydrogen. Hmm. It'll produce electricity and hydrogen. Wow. So it could be used both ways, right? Take, a, take another step, you've got the 90 megawatt um, uh, incineration plant. And I'll call it an incinerator, right? Yeah. H power. H power, thank you. H power is an incinerator. That's emitting worse emissions than even HECO is with yeah, the fuel Particulates and everything. And particulates yeah. and yeah. everything you can think of that's bad. Um, why don't we take that municipal solid waste and convert it into hydrogen? You know, you, you've got all that municipal solid waste coming from Oahu that could easily be, you know, introduced, put into gasification mm -hmm. systems. Gasification systems are going to create syngas, turn the syngas into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Or liquid fuels. And there you go. Sure. You know, you, this way you're, you're doing two things. You're eliminating what's going to the landfill just like what they're doing with the incineration. But you're doing it now with near zero emission. If not zero emission, you might have a, a tiny bit of emission coming from the gasification system, but even that's supposed to be 0% oxygen. I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in 60 seconds and talk some more about some of the details of getting to 2045 and clean energy. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life, and the lives of people around you. Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health. We'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man. And we just started launching into Mission Impossible, that is trying to get Hawaii <laughs> off the fossil fuels by 2045, at least on the grid. And uh, we just started rolling before the break, so we're gonna get right back to that. And uh, so Russ, you know, we were talking about some of the options, but uh, yeah, and, and another thing that makes the hydrogen piece kind of interesting to me on our grid is that if we're gonna keep using solar and wind, those are intermittent renewables. Unlike the coal, unlike the, the H power, those are intermittent, and that gives HECO fits in terms of balancing their grid, stabilizing right. their grid. That's correct. So when you have that kind of instability, one of the perfect things to do to help stabilize your grid is throw electrolyzers out there. So when you're, when you're producing too much solar or too much wind, you dump it into those electrolyzers and make hydrogen to make energy for later in the day or at night, you know, when you need it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so is that one of the possible solutions, maybe doing hydrogen in combination? Absolutely, it is. Uh, you know, let's take a base. Um, a, a base that I'm familiar with has a landfill. Base has a wastewater treatment plant, mm -hmm. right? And it has lots of land. Uh, we could take that wastewater treatment plant and we could take 
all that sludge material, put it into the same thing, gasification system, turn it into syngas, renewable natural gas, the way Hawaii Gas is doing out at the Huli Huli. On Huli Huli. On Huli Huli. Uh, wastewater treatment plant, making renewable natural gas. In our case, we could turn it into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. right? On a base uh, that I'm particularly familiar with, I want to make that wastewater treatment plant its own microgrid. Perfect. Because if you don't and you lose that, you, you sort of lost your heart. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the heart of the system. Well, that's what we, you know, we talk about. One of the other challenges with our grid is that if you have a natural disaster um, and you lose power, um, now all of a sudden your sewage systems and your freshwater systems exactly. and your hospitals and other things that exactly. require energy or require pumping to move things around um, are dead in the water. Exactly. Whereas if you build the system correctly, your wastewater treatment plant becomes self-sustaining. And you don't have to, you, know, you get, you fix whatever little minor things might be happening from the storm itself, mm -hmm. and then it's taking care of itself. You don't have to wait for the grid to come up, or you don't have to find diesel fuel someplace to get a generator in there. That's exactly the point. Uh, everything that, that we deal with now at a base has to do with re being resilient. The Department of Defense is requiring every base to come up with a plan be resilient for a minimum of 14 days mm -hmm. and that's what you said natural disaster it, it actually is for a natural disaster or a man-made disaster a attack, it yeah. could be a, an attack uh, i was recently well recently a couple months ago i was at the joint base pearl harbor industry day because they're looking at putting a resilient plant in and the Number one thing they, they opened the entire conference up to was we've got threats. We've got threats from China. We've got to deal with this. You know, we, we need power. You know, all of your forward bases for any, any sort of a, uh, you know, a response is right here. This, this is it. Hawaii to Asia is, you know, Schofield, Hickam, uh, Marine Corps Base Hawaii. In Pearl Harbor, those are the those are the forward bases for anything mm -hmm. that happened. That struck me uh, very seriously because it told me that you need this power like tomorrow, and they need a hundred to one hundred and fifty megawatts of resilient power. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't quite agree with how they wanted to do it, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I already have my strategy for the base that I work work with, and that. We have a hydrogen fuel station, just like you have down at Hickam, only right. yours is much bigger than ours. I would like to expand our, our uh, hydrogen fuel station so that we, we can have enough hydrogen for firm power, not just transportation sure. power, um, and then use our, our landfill to create as much storage for hydrogen as we can. As we've talked about, wastewater treatment plant, microgrid that plant by itself and use, use the resources that we have. We need to bring in more hydrogen, fine, we bring in more hydrogen. But that needs to be a self-sustaining operation within the base. Mm -hmm. um, I've carved out a section of, of this base for, for wind turbines. I've carved out other areas for larger solar farms. Um, along with battery storage, and hydrogen energy storage and potential for geothermal. Um, so, so currently, though, the, the, I, I'm familiar with at least the Air Force side. Um, the critical facilities, facilities you need to have up and running, maybe your clinic and your commissary or, you know, for food storage and things like that, you have diesel generator backup systems or communications networks and things like that. But I point out to the DOD, or I used to, that we're on an island. If our ports are impacted, damaged, and can't receive cargo, or our airports are closed down and can't receive aircraft, we only have seven or so days worth of fuel that at that point, now the hospitals and everybody else are gonna be all wanting that same fuel for priority reasons. And the DOD becomes competition for those assets. And the DOD should probably be more self-sufficient. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it, it sort of 
weighs into a segment that I mentioned during that Joint Base Pearl Harbor victim conference. Um, I questioned the, uh, the lead civilian for Pearl Harbor. I said, do you consider fuel oil to be a resilient fuel? And he looked at me and I said, I don't. That has to come over here by ships. You're talking about war. You're talking about tsunamis, hurricanes, and potential for war. That, to me, is not a resilient fuel if it has to come over here by ship. What fuel can you produce here in Hawaii? Not natural gas, and it's not fuel oil. It's hydrogen. Yep. You, know, you know better than I that you know, hydrogen, being the, the, the most abundant substance in the universe, is something Hawaii could take advantage of. Sure. Every one of the states could take advantage of it. Um, everything I mentioned about doing it at the base. Translates to eco. Yeah. Translates to the rest of yeah. the island yeah. and the rest of the state. Yeah. And that's where you know, I, I tell my, uh, my board with AEE, you know, this is what I'm doing here at the base, but this is all stuff that I want to translate out yeah. to the island exactly. of Hawaii this is what we should be doing. We need to be talking about more than just transportation. We need to be talking about firm power. Yeah. And, and the, the discussion has literally come full circle now because you think of cogen, or you think of using waste heat, and you think of the Big Island as not only a big, beautiful island, but has some of the hottest territory right under the skin that could be generating electricity like nobody's business. And we could be importing that energy to Oahu in the form of ammonia or hydrogen or some hydrogen-rich, you know, liquid fuel or gaseous fuel, and providing that baseload power for HECO to be able to carry on in their new microgrid system. Absolutely, uh, HECO could be doing the same thing that we're talking about yep. um, on a scale, the statewide scale. On the statewide scale. Um, I didn't mention, but uh, years ago when I was now running the, uh, the, the energy company that my father built and founded, I was, uh, we were representatives of two cogeneration systems. Ecogen, which is a small 454 Holman and Moody engine cogeneration package, but then capstone turbines. Mm. Capstone turbines were used in buses, sure. uh, you know, and all sorts of different scenarios, but there's a lot of, a lot of uh, mainland, in fact, Maui has a hotel with several capstone turbines uh, running for their, their waste heat, using all the waste heat in the cogen. I tried to give a capstone turbine to HECO back in the early, back in the 90s, mm -hmm. and they didn't want it. Yeah. I just wanted to send it to them, let them test it. Well, I hope that we can, uh... Convince Hiko to broaden her aperture a little bit, work with folks like you and the, <laughs> the folks at the EE to, uh, to really get us to that goal. Because it's pretty ambitious. It's a lot more complicated than people think. Uh, but I think we'll get there. Believe it or not, we've, we've hit 30 minutes already, Russ. Wow, that's amazing. I told you it would go by quick. But you I want to thank you really for being on the show today. You're very and, welcome. Uh, my, my pleasure. It was fun. Well, we'll have, <laughs> let you get a little more, more time over at Kaneohe. And maybe if you can get the military to to let you talk about specific things over there. We'll have you back on the show and talk about some of the issues that you're, you're working with. That would be fantastic. So thanks again. And uh, until uh, next week, Friday, we'll see you here on Standard Energy Man at ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha.